Well, thank you all for coming to my talk on machine learning and statistics don't mind the gap. The title of the talk implies, first of all, that there is a gap, and that is actually not an uncontested point. And there are um, quite a few in the statistics and machine learning community who are like, uh, especially in the statistics community, who are like, oh, well, it's all just one thing. And uh, there's this one comic that I think is quite funny and also has some truth to it, but that is like sort of the sentiment is like, well, if you're standing in front of a crowd like me here, right, then you're talking about artificial intelligence, right, uh, which of course sounds amazing. But really, that is just machine learning, and that really is just window dressing for good old statistics. And I think there is some truth to that, and definitely there are very deep connections between machine learning and statistics, but there are also many differences definitely in the cultures and the histories of how those two fields develop and the emphasis they placed on certain problems that they want to solve. The first version of this talk that I, uh, that I created was sort of just like then going through contrasting machine learning and statistics, and that turned out to be a little bit dry. Um, so for my own uh, entertainment and hopefully yours as well, we're going to talk about uh, two protagonists that will be the archetypes of um, of our story here and the archetypes of these two domains, right? So instead of just machine learning statistics, we will be uh, talking about our first protagonist, which is statistical Rick here. And he studied applied math, right? That's uh, where statistics is, is rooted in. And he, the way like the models there are often created is you have some problem and then you say, okay, I'm gonna start with some assumptions that I have, like the normality assumption for my data. Then you say, okay, now I'm gonna let n go to infinity, and the number of data points go to infinity, you do a whole bunch of math, and then you find like, okay, this is the correct thing to do. And a lot of very fundamental theorems have been proved that way, and it's an amazingly powerful and important approach. Uh, but then if you actually wanna do data science and apply these tools, you have to be very careful in whether your assumptions are actually met in your data, right? So if you violate the normality assumption, then like your t-test will just go out the window. And it's very easy to shoot yourself in the foot that way. The models that he builds are often linear and have fewer parameters. That's mostly historical. Just back then, um, there weren't that many covariates that we were using. And also, linear models have the amazing property that actually you can understand them much better, right? So often, we like to think linearly um, and a model that just tells you, okay, these two things are correlated in a GLM or something like that. Uh, you can write a paper about that and then like other people can build on your theory, right? That's how science progresses essentially. And large data sets, uh, well, these methods weren't really developed for large data sets, right? So, and they actually don't really work all that well. Uh, for example, if you have like terabytes of data, right? There's no, no real mini batching or something that has been developed. So, um, and the other problem is also, for example, with like hypotheses tests, these often, like everything starts becoming significant if you have like millions of data points. So it's the question of how useful is that really? And as a proper statistician uses R and Python stats models. So let's meet machine learning Morty, our second protagonist. He studied computer science and doesn't really care so much about like the asymptotic behavior, but really mainly cares, can I accurately predict my labels or, um, or my variables. So that's really the emphasis. And he is happy if there is an algorithm that he might not understand why it works, but he can show that like, it works really well in predicting this, right? like random forests or some things like that. Often the algorithm came before people really started understanding the statistical underpinnings of those. And so these methods are often not really all that sensitive to the assumptions that are placed in them because they're much more flexible in terms of what they learn about the data. But the field is very much focused on overfitting, right? So if you care about accuracy, you care, don't care about accuracy in your training set, you care about accuracy in your testing set. There have been all kinds of methods developed, how do you measure overfitting, how to prevent overfitting, and just a very rich literature based on that and that's sort of often baked into the algorithms. And the models are mostly nonlinear and have many parameters, right? So it's not uncommon to have deep neural networks with hundreds of thousands, millions of parameters that you then train and they learn these extremely complex nonlinearities. 
The models, however, then, because they are so complex on highly high dimensional and nonlinear, it's very hard to really reason about. And that is something that I actually think is a bigger problem in machine learning that a lot of people realize is when you actually then go into a business setting where you might want to apply machine learning, right? You have trained your model and it's working really well. You go to like the business person and explain it and then they're like, oh, but like, I can't really understand the predictions that come out of this, right? And you can't really explain it to me. And then they will be very hesitant to actually employ that model in production, right? So there's a lot of pushback actually on that when you actually try to do that in a applied setting. And because the models are so complex and high dimensional, you require huge amounts of data. So the breakthrough in deep learning was caused by all these great developments of convolutional neural networks, but also just by the ImageNet data set, which was just like the biggest one that was available. And then all of a sudden, with strong GPUs, you could really, for the first time, like train that and actually like learn these huge complex models. And instead, he likes to use TensorFlow and Scikit-Learn. OK, so now that we've met our two protagonists, uh, I want to preface what the point that I'm trying to make here. And that is that there isn't enough crosstalk between these two people, right? They go to different parties. They hang out in different crowds. Uh, but I think there is actually a lot that they can learn from each other. And by, and by combining, just taking the best ideas that each field has developed, right, and combining them, I hope I can show that we can solve complex problems that neither approach alone could solve. So what we will do is we will go on a journey with Rick and Morty and give them increasingly challenging problems, starting very, very simple, and then ramping up, which they're going to uh, try and like bridge their differences and their different perspectives, bring what they have to the table, and sort of try and find a middle path to uh, solve, solve these problems. Right. So the problem domain that we're going to use is quantitative finance. And uh, I thought I'd just give you a little bit of background how I created the data set that I'm going to show. And I used Quantopian, uh, which is the company that I work for. And that is a platform where you go online and you get uh, a Jupyter Notebook kernel running on our cloud infrastructure. And you have all your favorite Python packages. But most critically, you also have access to a whole array of data that we put a lot of emphasis on and like, making sure that data is clean and, survive and buys free and just to lower the barrier of entry where you just like don't have to deal with all the boring stuff, but just go in and can directly start working with data and generating graphs and coming up with ideas, maybe. And then also interact with our community of over 200,000 members, where they meet on a forum and discuss ideas and uh, ask questions. And there's a whole spectrum of people from like high schoolers who just like are starting to learn Python to quant finance professionals. We had a Russian astronaut on the platform. Um, so it's a huge uh, variety of all walks of life who come together and just like learn and help each other and interact. And uh, if, you, if you know quant finance, that is actually kind of unusual. So a lot of people told us that this was crazy and would never work because no one would ever like actually engage and discuss these things openly because the domain is so secretive. But actually, uh, th that turned out to be wrong, fortunately. So we're trying to build on this open source mentality. Uh, there's also lots of training materials on the website that you can check out that um, are also interesting just if you care about data science and want to learn pandas and numpy and then ramps up to statistical concepts and how they can apply, be applied to quant finance. There's videos and Jupyter notebooks that you can just directly clone and play around with on your own. And there are uh, trading competitions where if you have an idea for an algorithm that finds some niche in the market that can be uh, profitable, then you can enter that into our trading competition and win a cash prize. But the most uh, sought after price for most people on the platform is that if it's, is if it's really something unique and special, then we will contact you and ask you to license your strategy to us. And then we take that strategy and invest outside capital from external investors into that strategy, similar to like a hedge fund would do, right? Except we'll, you are the quant who developed that strategy. And then, of course, uh, the profits generated by that strategy, most of that goes back to the investor whose money it was in the first place. But 10% of that goes to, to you, the quant. So uh, without basically taking on any risk yourself, 
uh, there's a lot of upside potential there and our current maximum allocation size is 50 million so you can sort of back that out by yourself. And the platform is completely free to use and um, you keep your intellectual property. So again, we just license it. We rent your idea for as long as you make it available to us, but um, we never take any claim into your, your intellectual property. Okay, so I use Quantopian um, to pre load in the data and pre-process it, and then I thought I'd give you like an overview of like what the certain stages that you were trying to get to in quant finance or like one type of workflow that I think is very amenable to like a data science approach. And one common thing to do is called factor-based investing. And very simply what you do is you have, say, uh, a security. Here I'm taking Apple because everyone always takes Apple. Um, and then for every day, we uh, want to compute some features. And here I computed the simplest, one of the simplest features that you could do. And one is momentum. That means the stock price has been going up. And then the other one is mean reversion, which is sort of the mirror opposite of that, is that it's gone maybe up so long that now it's reverting back to its mean. And both of those might carry information, predictive information, about the future of the stock, right? So what we're trying to do then is combine this with labels. And here I'm simplifying by just saying, OK, I want to know if, in response to having seen that row on the next day, did the, was the return of that stock positive or negative? So I'm just going to label that plus or minus. So here it was negative, uh, it was negative, negative, uh, positive. So this is the one day forward return. So the first day is the 15th, um, but we have to align them, of course. So that is the, the data that uh, we have. And I'm going to, for the interest of this talk, uh, abstract this. And we're going to use simulated data where it's just more obvious what's happening, right? We can more easily reason about this. So this is the half moon data set or generative process. And here I'm just displaying it. So we have our two features on the x and y axis, momentum and mean reversion. And then every dot would be a, a day of that a row in that matrix that I showed before. And we have the colors being whether the return was positive or negative. And we can abstract this even more. Uh, just to use the labels that are commonly used in machine learning. We're just calling our inputs x1 and x2. Those are the two inputs. And our output labels, uh, our targets y. OK, so let's, obviously, we want to be able to, if, if we were able to write uh, on unseen data, say, OK, the stock's going to go up or down, right? Then we can write a trading algorithm that exploits that and sort of goes into those positions where the stock is going to go up and go down. So if we were able to predict that, that would be a really powerful trading algorithm. So we're going to ask our two protagonists to sort of see how they attack that problem. So Morty says, well, that's a typical machine learning classification problem if I've ever seen one. And Rick says, oh, well, uh, probably as a statistician, you think I won't be able to solve this, but we said since can also classify, and it's called logistic regression. He says, well, I trust that you can do a prediction, but actually there's a lot more nuance to it than you might think. We're happy to collaborate with you on that, but we also need a tool that we can sort of cooperate on, right, and, um, and incorporate our different perspectives. And Rick says, I heard about this package called PyMC3, all the cool kids use. And it's the cool kids that we are, that's what we're going to use today. Um, OK, so what is PyMC3? High level, it's a probabilistic programming framework for Python, which is free and open source software. And it allows it to specify arbitrary probabilistic models in computer code, in Python code, by plugging probabilistic distributions into each other. So it's sort of different in that regard from scikit-learn, right, where you have already like prepackaged models and a huge variety of those that you can just use and train. Here you can build these models your own and build tailored models to uh, your, your particular problem that you want to use. So there's a lot of flexibility in that approach. Uh, and sort of at the back of your mind, right, so that is sort of the meta level that I want to talk about as well. I'm going to show some very specific models, but that is really mainly to show the power of the approach and what you can do with that and make a point about machine learning and statistics. But uh, you're free to use that tool, of course, uh, and apply it to whatever problem that you care about. That's really what it's about. 
we try to make the model specification syntax as intuitive as possible. So uh, if you would write in statistics, X is distributed according to normal distribution, that just translates to Python code uh, that you can see there. And the really cool thing about this is that once you have built your model, and it can be a really complex model, it turns out that if you then want to do inference on that and do it analytically, that is impossible. Uh, just the math is, is way too insane. Uh, but there exists this extremely powerful class of inference algorithms that do that automatically at whatever model you dream up. So that is a really nice addition to this framework. So we can not only like create these models, but we can also do automatic inference. So I like to call this the inference button, where like you just dream up your model, write it in Python, and then hit the inference button, and it gives you the right answers automatically. Very, and I continue to be blown away, like how powerful these algorithms have gotten, and that is sort of also what is leading to a bit of a, a renaissance in that field. So probably some programming systems have been around since I think even the 70s, uh, but they were mostly just for like small toy models because the inference algorithms weren't that powerful. But nowadays, uh, with the new class of, of samplers, they like, can be used for real hardcore modeling. And, um, and I continue to be amazed like how insane the models are that we can build and then just like, have, have the inference run and it does the right thing. There are generally two types of inference algorithms that people use. One are sampling algorithms, like Markov Chain Monte Carlo. And those are very accurate, but slower. So, and then there is variational inference, the other side of the coin, um, and that is less accurate, but much, much faster. So there's mini batch algorithms, and if you want to do machine learning, based in machine learning, then that is often what you want to use and, and make it scale. So for, uh, yeah, for like more targeted statistical modeling, usually people sample, and then for larger scale things where you might more care about the predictions rather than the correct inference of the model, that's where you want to use variational inference. And for the technically minded on Bangu, uh, the software is a thin layer on top of Theano, which is a deep learning library similar to TensorFlow. And that allows us to have you write your model in Python, which you might think would be very slow. But actually, we take the compute graph that that model specifies and then can do all kinds of simplifications and optimizations on that graph, and then take that. And Theano compiles that to C code, which you can then compile to machine code or run it on the GPU, so where it's really, really fast. So uh, that, that is working out really well uh, in terms of having these layers of abstraction. OK, so who here knows how logistic regression works? OK, fantastic. Um, so um, Rick goes on to explain um, we have our input data x, our two columns, x1, x2. And then we have our coefficients, W1, or weights, W1 and W2. And then the first thing we do is we just do the dot product between our input matrix, 2 by n, and our two coefficients. And that gives me a linear projection, right? That's just linear regression. And then I, because my output labels are binary, I want to reinterpret those linear weights as probabilities. So I want to squash them to be between 0 and 1. And the sigmoidal function or logistic function is the one that does that. So I'm just putting those into those, and then I get probabilities. And uh, then in, whenever you build probabilistic models, you have to specify the likelihood of your data, how, how you evaluate how good the, your model explains the data. And because we have binary outputs labels that we want to model, that is the Bernoulli or coin flip distribution. OK, so Rick explains that, and then uh, Morty is, is not impressed. He says, well, in machine learning, we just call this a perceptron, right? So the two are mathematically equivalent. And already there, we see that there are these deep connections between uh, these two fields, right, where they basically do the same thing with just calling it different names. And usually, this is plotted like that, where you have your input neurons and then uh, the, the perceptron that does the linear combination and then the, applies the nonlinearity and then we just play, train our, uh, the network to give us the labels that we want. And uh, while I'm here, I also want to sort of um, again highlight another different perspective that turns out to be the same thing. In machine learning, right, what we want to do is minimize the error. 
And in probabilistic modeling, we instead want to maximize the likelihood of observing the data that we have. So on the right side, the perceptron, we would just tweak the Ws as to minimize the, our predictions w, uh, Y. And on the left side, we would, maximize, uh, we would find the Ws that give me the highest likelihood, the, the best probabilities that give me the highest likelihood of observing my output data, right? So these are just two perspectives, but it turns, also turns out that those are mathematically identical. Okay, so um, there's not too much code in this, but still I wanna give you a sense of like what this model building looks like in, in PyMC3. So we have, first we import our module, PyMC3 as PM, and then the first line is just boilerplate code where you s initialize your model, so we are creating a new model object and binding it to that logistic regression object, and that just initializes the model and basically tells that uh, Python that everything that happens indented underneath there is a model spe specification, so that just holds it all together. That's just a technicality. The really interesting things then happen below that where we now define our model. And we just kind of built the model that I laid out on the previous slide, and hopefully you'll see that that follows each line very closely. The first thing we do is we initialize our parameters, and I'm gonna call the, that variable weights, and I'm, we're going to play around with this later, but for now, I'm just using pymc3.flat, which essentially is a distribution on initialization that says, I don't want to constrain that parameter in any way, right? So it can be minus 5,000, it can be 3,000. Without having seen any data, I'm not going to constrain it in any way, right? That's usually what you do in, in optimization, right? You just have a parameter and, and you just estimate the best fitting value. And the first argument to that is the weights, it's just the name, we just call it weights. And the second one is a shape argument, which we can provide. In this case, right, we have a two by one vector, so we could just give it shape two. And then we just follow through, we apply the dot product between our input array data x, which is a numpy array, uh, right, for every data, every data point that, as we looked at before, and that gives us a 1D projection, linear projection between those. We put that into our sigmoid function. Again, PyMC3 has all these already baked in, and that gives us, then squashes those to be probabilities, and then we define our likelihood function, the Bernoulli, we give it a name, we connect it to the, the probabilities of my binary events will be given by my model, right, by the stuff that we looked at before, and now I specify that this is, that I observe data, right, that this is basically something that I want to maximize, so I'm passing in the binary target array that, that we had on the right side before. Cool, okay. So that is uh, our probabilistic program, and you can already see really why that's, this is called probabilistic programming, right? Because that's what we're doing, right? We're starting with some parameters, doing arbitrary transformations on them, defining our likelihood, and then that is our model. And now the question is, well, okay, how do we do inference on that? How do we actually fit that to data? And the simplest thing we can do is do maximum a posterior approximation. And that is just saying, okay, I want to find those parameters that maximize the likelihood of having seen that data, seen those binary labels. And that happens very quickly, and then we can investigate that, and it shows me, okay, these are the two parameter values that best describe uh, the data. And of course, we can visualize that, and it's just a linear line. Logistic regression is a linear model, right? So it's sort of the, the limitation here, and it, Given that it's a linear fit, we're just trying to, uh, it, it is like providing the best thing, the best separating line possible with that. Okay, so Rick is pretty happy with that. Uh, see, we said this isn't can classify just fine. Uh, but you also mentioned before that it's a little bit more complex in terms of doing predictions. So what do you think is missing? Why well, says, well, where to start? First of all, uh, because you usually use simple models in low dimensions, you don't worry about overfitting enough. In machine learning, we usually deal with many more dimensions and have to apply what's called regularization, uh, trying to keep our weight small, uh, for example, by adding a quadratic penalty term, right? So generally, that is just um, something, a heuristic that works is to prevent overfitting, you want your parameters to be close to zero so that they don't just like shoot out and like uh, basically use every little bit they have available to them to do that, and that leads to a better out-of-sample accuracy. 
Rick says, well, what you call a penalty term, I call a prior. So these allow me to specify knowledge I have about my parameters before having seen any data. And interestingly, it turns out that if I use a normal prior, that is mathematically equivalent to your quadratic penalty term. So again, we see these deep mathematical connections where we have equivalence between, okay, like you just call this a quadratic penalty term on your objective function, and that is the same thing as me just placing a normal prior on my parameters. Okay, so they'll go back to the code and try to incorporate the feedback that Morty gave, and that is just a one-line code change where now instead of the flat distribution, right, which just said, well, any value is equally likely, now we're gonna say, okay, without having seen any data, in, if there is the choice, right, uh, we, want, we, we like to keep things closer to zero. So that doesn't like completely dominate the fit later on, but it sort of just shrinks everything towards that zero. And with more and more data, there will be more and more, uh, the prior will matter less and less, uh, but it, it has that regularizing effect. And when we fit this, again, with the find map function, we see that indeed the parameter values now are, are smaller, but the fit that they provide are actually the same. Okay, Morty says, wow, I'm so impressed. Not. Uh, I could have gotten the exact same result with a single line of cycle learn code. And, and that's true, right? So there's logistic regression and it's regularized, so you just like have a single line. Now I showed you this whole stuff, like why even like bother? Um, so Rick says, well, you're right, but I was just taking it easy on you. Usually, Bayesians don't use the map estimate, which provides just a single answer, but we look at the posterior, which provides all the answers. For example, our model produced this separating line, right? And, but what about this line, right? That also seems to do just a fine job as, as that line, or maybe that line, or that line, or that line, right? So why did you pick just that, that particular line, right? Is that the only one that works, or are there other ones and other parameter values that go with that that explain my data just as well or maybe just a little bit worse. So that is a general, uh, the idea of uncertainty around your parameters, right? If you can't expect with limited data to like find the one true parameter value, right? There will always be uncertainty in your fit and you wanna be able to quantify that uncertainty in your model given your data. And that actually has a lot of very powerful applications down the line when you start doing that and carry that all the way through and we will look at some of those. So then in PyMC3, we have our identical model to before, but now we just want to use a different inference algorithm. So in the very last line, instead of calling find map, we just call the fit function, which does variational inference, which is what I talked about in the overview slide for PyMC3. And that gives me the best fitting parameter values as before and as the means. But it also gives me a second thing, which are the standard deviations of my parameter fits. So you can think about this as error bars around your, around your weights. So we don't just get a single answer like the red line with our map fit, but we get like all the answers in terms of a posterior distribution. So that's the way to think about this. And it's a really different um, frame of mind basically where you never really deal with like point values and individual, yeah, individual values, but you're always thinking about in terms of distributions that represent the uncertainty you have in your model. Uh, just as an aside, um, so this is the model that, are, the very first model that I showed, and this is the posterior distribution that we get um, from, from the last model. Does anyone know why those don't agree? Maybe it's not that clear, but uh, so this is from the model with the flat prior. And the reason is that's the fact of our shrinkage, right? So we want those, we said that we have prior information where we want those parameters to be closer to zero, and that just has the effect of shrinking or moving that distribution further to zero. So this is closer to zero um, on both sides. And then we can plot this by just projecting out back the decision boundary so we don't just get a single boundary but we get all of those uh, boundaries that all provide reasonable fit. That's cool. And because we don't just have a single parameter value, we also don't just get a single prediction, right? We actually get a whole ensemble of predictions for every parameter of value one. And I can visualize this by evaluating the classifier on a grid that I have in the background here, and then just look at the, the standard deviations. So intuitively, you can think of this 
this is the uncertainty the classifier has about points in that space. So, and you can see how that increases as we go closer to the decision boundary, right? Just intuitively you would think, well, yeah, if there is, where would be the most uncertainty? That's where you really can't tell which of the two classes it is. So that makes sense. And the further you get away from that, the, the more certain you become. And that is something that you can't really uh, get with, for example, if you run this in scikit-learn, right? So the output might be probabilistic, um, right? It could tell you, like, um, let's say you have an application in uh, skin cancer or something, and you build a classifier that says, okay, that's an 80% probability. And then the question is, like, do you do uh, a, like a very invasive therapy uh, to do that that has a high risk of, like, hurting the patient? Then all of a sudden, it's like, well, what does 80% really mean, right? And how certain am I in those 80%? Like, could it be 50%? Like, maybe that is something that the classifier just hasn't seen before and just assigns, like, one random, that, one random value uh, because it ha wasn't trained on that region of the parameter space before because the model can't inform you that it doesn't really know the answer to that, right? So with uncertainty in our predictions, we get exactly that information that we want, and we can use that to better guide our decisions. And there's a theorem all that proves that if you include uncertainty in your predictions, you will always make better decisions than if you don't. So there's, you don't lose anything, but you gain a lot. And that is essentially what Bayesian statistics is, right? It's a very principled framework for quantifying uncertainty and, getting, and carrying that all the way through. So that's what I meant earlier. Rick says, boom, can't do that with scikit-learn. And he says, well, I guess. Um, but what is it with you statisticians and your linear models? The world's complex. In machine learning, we actually extended the idea of a linear perceptron to a neural network, which is great at learning nonlinearities. So he goes on to explain what neural networks are. Uh, it's basically a very sophisticated way of banging yourself in the head, if you believe that uh, comic. Uh, but actually, it is very similar to what we already see, in, right? It is just taking that very simple idea of a perceptron and adding more perceptrons. That, that's really all it is. So you stack perceptrons vertically and horizontally, and the amazing thing about neural networks is if you just like, keep doing that and add more and more data, then like, amazing things happen. And we don't really understand why yet, but um, it just works really well. So we can do that in PyMC3. I'm not going to show you the code. It's basically just an extension of what we looked at before, right? You have like more priors and then just keep applying that same logic, the dot product. So um, check out my blog post in the bottom, but just the visualization shows, okay, well, actually now this is able to learn that nonlinearity, right, and do a much better job at predicting the labels um, just by yeah, adding more perceptrons, right? So, that is essentially what neural networks are. They're extremely efficient at learning these, uh, at learning high-dimensional nonlinearities. And of course, we also get uncertainty in our predictions. And this is, uh, th there's one subtle point here that is, I think, kind of interesting, and that is that uh, if you compare this with the previous one, the uncertainty in these, the uncertainty went way down, right? So here the uncertainty is, very large on that region and then decays very slowly, but by fitting a model that actually models the data much more accurately, we get mu much more certainty in our predictions, right? So all of a sudden, like, oh yeah, this whole thing makes much more sense, so we get more certainty. Cool, okay. So in the last part of this talk, um, I wanna make it a little bit more challenging for two protagonists, right? So before, that was like very simple toy models uh, just to demonstrate the the concept and how you can mix and match these two approaches, uh, but there's this very common type of data that I see all the time, and very rarely is it really, I think, adequately handled, and that is nested data. So if you have that, and to project that into our quant finance example, imagine that now, instead of just having a single stock for every day, we have three or however many stocks on every day, right? And then we have values for each of those. So. Now, the, what we might intuit about this, right, is that, well, the relationships between each of those stocks and the outputs, the future returns, won't be the same for every stock, right, but they probably will have some similarities, right? So we would like to learn the similarities and the differences. So that is what we're going to talk about. 
And again, here I'm using simulated data, and instead of just having that one half moon, now what I did is I created nine half moons, so they all come from the very same distribution, and then I just rotated each time randomly. Right, so we have a common higher order structure that in data space, however, is completely, um, looks completely different each time. And so you can see like there won't be a single classifier where like you merge all of those points together, right? It will just like look like one big mess. And um, to make things even more interesting, uh, I'm just gonna subsample the distribution that I just showed you down to 50 data points. That's actually not all that uncommon, right? You might have a huge data set, but you have many, many nested structures in there so that then for every class or group in your data set, you actually end up with just a few data points. Uh, like, I don't know, if you do app tech and you have like a huge catalog of products, right? Uh, and you wanna like maximize click-through rate or whatever, then uh, often you don't have a lot of measurements for every individual item. And some you have a lot, but you sort of wanna pool that and, and um, and get the best out of your data that you have. And already you can see like, okay, just visually this seems like really difficult, right? Just inferring, like now we know, right, that, there is, that we should find that N, uh, that Z-shaped uh, decision boundary, but if I just showed you this before, you probably wouldn't be so sure what, what to do with that. So it's of course gonna be challenging for our machine learning algorithm as well. Okay, Morty says, are you kidding me? Machine learning, and this is called the multitask transfer learning problem, or simplified version of that, and it's far from solved. My best idea I can, up with, uh, can come up with is just to train separate neural networks on, on all of those groups, right? And, well, we, we might, um, yeah, uh, so th that is like a very simple thing to do, but obviously it's probably not the most satisfying thing to do. And Rick agrees with that and says, well, then we have to fit and evaluate N models for N classes, more, mo more models, more problems. Um, also, 50 data points is not it's probably not gonna be enough, but let's just give it a try. So I'm just gonna take the neural network model that I ran on the previous one, run it in a loop, right, on each of those nine ones, uh, nine data sets, and then show you the result. So this is what it looks like. Illustrate a little bit differently, so the colors are just the, what the classifier things in terms of the groups. And you can see, well, sometimes it seems to get it, like here, a little bit, but most of the time it's just a linear separating line that it tries to fit because you're like, yeah, it's not long of data. And Rick says, well, yeah, told you. And Maury says, well, yeah, I guess you're right, but do you even have a better idea? And Rick says, okay, well, in statistics, what we usually do in these cases is uh, we build hierarchical models for nested data structures. And that way we can learn differences and similarities between the stocks simultaneously. Maury says, what? <laughs> okay, let me explain. Um, so imagine that we generate data like this. Um, we have, uh, what I did here is I just picked f the number five and then I generated, I don't know, like 10, 10 means around five. And then for every one of those five means, I generated 100 data points. And those are the histograms, right? So you see like, well, they all have different means, right? All of those are different, but if I take the overall mean of all of those, then it will be close to five. So we have two bits of information here on two levels of that hierarchy. And the simplest thing that you might want to do if you care about the means of individual groups is to just fit a different mean to each of those, right? So you just take, take the mean and that, uh, that will give you an estimate, so that's okay. Uh, but really you are leaving something on the table, right? Because we know that there is sort of an underlying thing that they all uh, send it around five. So if we knew that, of course, our answers would be better. And the other alternative is to say, okay, well, we're just gonna pull all our data together, right? But that's also not satisfying if you're interested in the group means. So between those two extremes, we can actually find a middle way, and that is a hierarchical model, where instead of saying, okay, well, they're all different, or they're all the same, we're gonna say, well, they have differences, and we're gonna model those differences, these thetas, the means, but also we're gonna say, well, these individual means come from an overarching group distribution that we're also gonna estimate. So that way we understand, estimate the individual means and the means of means simultaneously. So that mu up here will be, should be close to five then, right? Because that's the overall group mean 
for all of those that I chose and the other ones. And what is cool about this is that if you, in a Bayesian framework, all of these basically are estimated at the same time. And that way they constrain each other. So the individual thetas inform the group distribution and the group distribution uh, like constrains those fits together. So, and that often leads to greatly enhanced inference and especially in those cases where, which we talked about in terms of, well, we have this uh, problem of like lots of data, but then once you start slicing it up, then it actually looks like small data. And, uh, and that way you can really pool together and still have a model for that. Applying that back to our neural networks, so this is essentially what we did before, right? We just had a loop, we have all these different neural network models, and in terms of the Bayesian priors that we generate for every weight from neuron I to neuron J of the first neural network, the second, back down to C, we just said, okay, this is distributed according to the normal distribution center on zero and one. So that is our regularization, right, that we applied, and already there you can see, well, these don't share any information between them, right? They're just parallelized versions of this, and that is what gave rise to that plot where each network wasn't able to really figure out that, that higher order pattern. Now, applying our hierarchical trick that we just learned, we can build like a quite complex model that we're now gonna say each of those individual Ws doesn't, is not distributed according to zero and one, but actually to a mu ij. And that mu ij comes from a group model, right, that has all these weights uh, that's sort of towering on top of everything else and informs all the other ones. So this w is shared between all the subnetworks and they basically inform the, the group model what like they learned and then like, they sort of constrain it back down, right? So we're pooling information from the bottom up and from the top down and, and finding the best group model and individual subnetworks that do that. And uh, check out my blog post for like the code and how to do that. There's a lot more detail there and some other uh, interesting things that we can derive from that. Well, and of course we estimate the standard deviation, but that's just um, basically how, how, how much do the individual, group, uh, the individual weights differ from, uh, from that group mean. But that's not really important. Okay, so, uh, what do you guys think? Do you think that worked? Well, I probably wouldn't be standing here uh, if it didn't. So, indeed, like fitting that model to the data, we can now infer that higher order structure, right, that wasn't directly encoded in the data, but the group model, the, the high towering model, figured that out and applied the right kind of regularization, nudging everything, every subnetwork into the right direction. And just the subnetworks basically figured out that, oh, yeah, we just need to rotate this, but there's always this common structure in there. So, um, so yeah, that's, um, and that is, uh, before I mentioned the multitask transfer learning problem, so in deep learning that is a huge problem, say uh, like the Atari paper, right, where like they fit individual neural network models to these Atari games and they play at superhuman capability, of course like all these games have some similarities among them and there's a lot of work that DeepMind is doing in terms of can I just train a single network that plays all of these games, right, and like sort of learns the similarities. And that is extremely challenging because there's this, what is called catastrophic forgetting. If you like train the network on the first task and it does amazing, then you train it on the second task and then it forgets everything it learned before. And these, and there is actually other papers as well going in that direction of building hierarchical models, uh, hierarchical neural network models that, that do that. Uh, but in general, I think we can be quite pleased with our protagonists. Mission accomplished. So um, to wrap up, I think both of those brought something to the table, right? So from machine learning, we learned to be very conscious of overfitting and using all these methods that have been developed, like regularization and you can place penalty terms that just translates to priors. Uh, and all, but also that not everything is linear, right? Neural networks are very powerful at doing that. And I think in science we might come to a point, definitely in some domains, where maybe reality is so complex that our linear models just can't work anymore, right? If, if, if reality is nonlinear and we might not be able to completely understand it, then the best thing we can do 
is just do prediction, right? We might not understand the model, but at least we can make predictions, right? So I think there are legitimate cases where that is the best we can do, and I think that's why these methods should be embraced. Um, also, software-wise, these deep learning frameworks, like Theano and TensorFlow, that have been developed, right, just for building these crazy neural networks, are so versatile that we can use them for something completely different, like probabilistic modeling, as, as PyMC3 does. And from statistics, we learned that, well, maybe you don't just want to find a single solution, but want to find all the solutions, right? And that gives you uncertainty in your predictions, which allow you to make better decisions. And we, there's like a whole bunch of other tricks that people have developed, like hierarchical modeling, that we can also bridge. So that is really uh, the, the overarching point that I'm trying to make is, we, it doesn't even matter if there are differences between those domains, right? What matters is making, <laughs> learning from data, right? That's what data science is. And we should use all the tools and all the techniques available to us, no matter where they come from, to build the perfect model for that particular problem that we're working on. And PyMC3 allows us to do that uh, by giving us the flexibility to build these models, very powerful inference algorithms to estimate that. So um, check out Quantopian if you're interested in quant finance. I'm on Twitter. Uh, you can find PyMC3 here. And uh, for like all the background information on the, the models that I show, check out my blog and also check out Rick and Morty. Uh, so thank you so much for your attention. I think we have time for questions. If there are any. Yes, please. So the question is, in that example I showed with the hierarchical neural network model, I chose the normal distribution um, in terms of like the, the, how the individual values are distributed, and the, can, we, can, can we choose different ones? And the answer is yes, absolutely. So the normal distribution is one very basic choice. Uh, here it makes sense because it relates to this quadratic penalty term, but there's like other penalty terms also being used in machine learning like um, L1 regularization, right, where you want to be, like, just set values exactly to zero, and there are different priors that you can use that correspond to that. Um, and, and those are all available in PyMC3, so there's, like, a whole library of distributions, and there's a lot of um, neat things and actual benefits you can gain from using those. Uh, just one fun example also where, like, these domains are merging is uh, dropout. So uh, dropout is, like, a regularization technique where you just randomly set some weights to zero uh, or like disable them while training and that again just helps against overfitting and that also was just discovered right so i think jeff hinton just like did that and it seemed to work amazingly well he didn't understand why but like machine learning that doesn't really matter but it turns out that there is and yaring gal has uh um a really cool paper on that where he shows that actually doing that is equivalent to a certain type of Bernoulli prior uh, that you can play. So yeah, there's all these interesting connections and these priors allow you to uh, gain a lot of modeling power that way. Thank you. So the question is, in the examples I showed, was all binary data, and for that we, the, pretty much the only choice is the Bernoulli distribution, but what about regression problems where you have, uh, where, where Bernoulli distribution just wouldn't work? And if you say, okay, I would just want to do like plain linear regression as uh, like people have been doing, um, then the equivalent to that piece would be if you were to use a normal distribution, right, where the data is normally distributed around your your linear line, um, and but then you can go and like actually also incorporate more things. Like for example, what if you have outliers, right? So linear regression is extremely.
fragile for uh, just like outlier values because the normal distribution has so small tails. So an outlier value will like have a great effect on your likelihood. And that's, for example, where if you have that, you can use a student T distribution, which is heavy tails. Um, and that is much more robust to, um, to outliers, for example. And I actually also have a blog post on like robust linear regression in Bayesian statistics where you just replace the normal likelihood with student T likelihood and you can also learn like that parameter. And then there's also like other kinds of models you can do where um, you can have a mixture model where you have a, um, a distribution for your inliers, so the actual data points, and then you have a separate likelihood function for your outliers and the model determines like which come from those that like wide outlier distribution and which come from um, the, the inlier distribution and on the PIMC3 homepage there's an example of that. It's a great question, thank you. Count data? Yep. Yep. You, yeah, you could. Um, so the question is, well, what if you have count data, for example? And uh, yes, in that case, you would use yet another um, likelihood function. And there is, a, for, and there is a function uh, like the negative binomial is one you can use, and that has the problem of having no no mass at zero. So um, and then in that case, actually, you do exactly what you said. You can use a mixture model where you have a zero inflated distribution that has both of those. Yeah. So we'll, we'll have to close the questions now. Okay, fantastic. Just so we can prepare for our, our next talk. But join me in thanking Dr. Thomas Fuki for this talk today. Thank you. Thanks so much.